Thank you, Shivani, and thank you all the participants. I can see so many familiar uh, faces. We might have seen each other and uh, interacted during many of some of the foundation courses in the past. I think, uh, as uh, Shivani mentioned, uh, this is a very ambitious project of Kalim. We are aiming to cover 650 medical colleges in the country. Uh, choosing faculties from each colleges and uh, training them based on the new CDME guidelines on palliative care and HCOM. Uh, we know that most of you are already involved in teaching HCOM, uh, but we thought it would be good if you get some more resource materials from our side, which you can use for uh, the ongoing teaching in HCOM. Again, CDME, everyone knows that everything is there, but we are focusing uh, for this course that what all modules are involved, and we are handing over all the resource materials to you during the course. Uh, there are around 21 modules uh, in CBMB which can be covered under palliative care starting from the year one, where they learn about the physiology of pain. Maybe that's where we can uh, start talking about total pain a little, little more than the uh, neurological pathways. So it starts from there, and uh, there are many more topics till the internship, actually. So we have uh, um, developed materials. Uh, the materials, the resource materials are developed by the experts across the country. They were sat together for months, uh, vetted by several other experts. So that will be handed over to you in the folders. You can use uh, whichever modules you feel comfortable. You can give us a feedback on the resources that we share. If you think that this is not handy, this is not practical, or we need something more, we need to in, 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 include something else, that will be a great learning for us also. We will be happy to rework on the resources uh, because we are also improving and learning uh, from each batch. So thank you everyone for your precious time and interest. And this is actually a hope for us that at least uh, there are people from around 20, 25 medical colleges here. So we uh, hope that at least 25 medical colleges in the country will start teaching palliative care to their students. So welcome you all for the program. Uh, Sripriya will be doing a round of introduction now, right? Uh, can you uh, speak, call the names that you can see on the sure, screen? Sure, so it will be indeed my pleasure. Uh, so uh, I'm just going through the participants list which is shown in my screen and we will be calling out names so that you can just have a brief introduction about you our, from where you come from what is your experience and what are your expectations from this program as well so the first name i see on screen is dr shanti case hello hello can you hear me yes ma'am perfectly please go ahead. i am working in government medical college for them and uh, i am additional professor in anesthesia there so we have a palliative uh, department that is run by the uh, radiation uh, radiotherapy department. We are just providing the pain, uh, interventional pain management, that sort of care we are providing. And that also in the beginning stage only. Now, after starting this, uh, when this palliative care is introduced to uh, MBBS curriculum, we have to take some classes and do it. So I thought I will get some uh, how to go with that. We get more idea and I can help my uh, uh, colleagues also know they were also asking what to how to approach this classes like. I'll just add one minute Shripriya. So I, for any of these anesthetists present in this group, there are six modules of uh, pain that comes purely under anesthesia in the third year of uh, MBBS. So uh, any anesthetist in the group plays a major role because that's how your students are going to learn pain and that's how they are going to see patients in pain. So uh, you play a major part uh, in, in uh, conceptualizing the pain uh, modules to the students. So thank you so much. Welcome, Dr. Shanti. Uh, next, I can see Dr. Anuj. Dr. Anuj Dubey. Uh, Dr. Anuj, I believe he is held up maybe call of duty. Next I can see is Dr. Anupama Muthi. Ma'am, you're muted. If you could unmute yourself. So good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice to see uh, and also again join back. I had done my foundation course in palliative medicine 
that was uh, two years ago. Uh, and uh, basically, I'm a professor of respiratory medicine from PSG Institute of Medical Sciences, Coimbatore. And uh, we are uh, also, I have also done my geriatric medicine. I take care of the geriatric patients. And uh, now we have got a palliative ward also. But the doctor from the palliative may not be on the medical college side. But then she's into the palliative uh, medicine. So it's like uh, interactive, this one, with all the people. And uh, uh, I'm also a famer fellow. And I'm actively involved in medical education unit. So I would maybe I can put it across regarding palliative to the chief of the MET. And we can see how we can carry it forward and to teach our undergraduates at our place. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anupama. Moving on, uh, I can see next on list, uh, Dr. Arun Muri. Uh, good afternoon, all. This is uh, Dr. Arun Muri, assistant professor from Department of Community Medicine uh, from Manakla Vinagar Medical College, Pondicherry. So I have finished a foundation course in palliative medicine. Uh, and we are running community-based uh, palliative care services in our uh, UHTC and RHTC centers. So, and I look forward for more inputs uh, to train interns as well as the undergraduates. Thank you. Warm welcome, Dr. Arunmuri. Uh, moving on next, uh, I can see um, Dr. Arun Bhatt. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Sri Priya, for supporting me through the registration process. I am uh, from basically from Community Medicine Department. I did my basic certification in palliative medicine from General Hospital Ernavulam uh, about one year back. Now I am a, a nodal officer for the palliative care unit in the medical college. So we have one week posting of house surgeons in the palliative care unit. I am looking forward uh, to learn some real life experience of tall wards to how to move on with the communication teaching. I'm very much interested in uh, teaching and learning. Thank you for uh, Thank you, Dr. Adam. Welcome to you. Now I can see the next on list is Dr. Bilal. Uh, I believe Dr. Bilal is uh, held up in DT. So moving on, next on list is Dr. Chetan. Chetan Rungi. Not sure if I'm pronouncing the names correctly. Sorry for that. Um, Dr. Prashant Sajan. Sorry, sir, I think uh, uh, you are not going to do um, Sir, I believe you need to change your headset device uh, because it is very disturbing. In the can meeting, you hear me now? Uh, sir, we can hear you, but the headset is... Uh, I believe if you are logged in using a... Um, the device that is creating more noise. Maybe you can try removing the headset and using the device speaker. Uh, we will go, definitely go back to Dr. Prashant Surgeon. In the meantime, I see the next in list, uh, Dr. Suraj. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Suraj Gohit working as a tutor in radiation oncology department, government medical college, Vadodra. And uh, uh, I, we are also running here a palliative ward where we have palliative care, we have palliative patients. So I'm looking forward to uh, gain more knowledge about how to train uh, paramedical staff and how to train MBBS students about palliative care and how to gain knowledge, how to uh, build up their knowledge in this particular uh, palliative medicine and palliative care. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Suraj and warm welcome. Moving on, I can see Dr. Vandana's name here. Dr. Vandana Kulkarni. Ma'am, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Vandana Kulkarni. I'm professor in anesthesiology at East Point Medical College, Bangalore. And I have been associated with TIPS before I completed the foundation course in palliative uh, medicine and pain uh, in the uh, last year. So it was a very fruitful experience for me then. And uh, our college does not have a palliative care unit as of now, but uh, the, we do have 150 undergraduate students. And I believe that uh, this, found, this course will help me in better teaching of the students and also laying a, a foundation sto a stone of starting the palliative care unit in our hospital. So I look forward to all the sessions with a lot of positivity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vandana. It is indeed a uh, personal pleasure to see you again after a long time. Uh, moving you. on, uh, I can see Dr. Ashwati Ravindran. Uh, hi, I'm Dr. Ashwati. I'm working as assistant professor in the Department of Community Medicine, uh, Manukla Nagar Medical College Foundation. I have completed a foundation course in uh, palliative care uh, last November to December. And uh, in our college, we have a really modern centers where we actually attend palliative care patients. We provide home care for them. And we also have a training program for internship just in the beginning of community medicine posting, where we orient them regarding how to um, treat a palliative care patient, how to approach the patients, you know. So I'm uh, looking forward to learn more uh, in teaching undergraduate students and also, we have an allied health students to whom we are planning to do a palliative care program. Yeah. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Ashwati. Uh, now I can see Dr. Harini Krishna. A very good afternoon to all of you. I'm Dr. Harini, and I'm, I work as an anesthesiologist in uh, Dayanand Sagar Medical College. I'm an assistant professor. I attended the foundation course recently, and uh, uh, I re we do not have a palliative care unit yet. But I really hope we can uh, set it up in our hospital to, from the guidance that I received through this program under the leadership of Dr. Madhu, who, is also, who also happens to be in this uh, group, who is a professor in our college. And there are many oncosurgeries that are done here, and we hope that uh, we'll be able to extend palliative care service to them through this uh, program. Welcome, Dr. Hari. It's nice having you at one more session. Um, next, I can see Dr. Uh, Sri Kalyani. Yes, yes, madam. Uh, good afternoon, madam. I'm Sri Kalyani, psychologist. Uh, I'm working in Gayatri Medical College. Uh, I completed my foundation course in your institution. And thank you, ma'am. Warm welcome, Dr. Sri Kalyani, for this course. Uh, now I can see. Um, Dr. Madhu, Dr. Madhu, yes. Hello, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Can you hear me, Dr. Yes, sir. You are good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm from Bangalore, uh, uh, from Dan Sagar Medical College. Uh, I did uh, FCPM uh, somewhere around in 2021. Uh, since then, I have been uh, trying to uh, start palliative care, sub, but somehow it's not working out. Uh, the main problem, what I could see is uh, you don't have uh, trained, uh, you know, people to do this. And uh, no, the, this won't be the scenario maybe five years down the line when all undergraduates are under, you know, trained in palliative care. And thanks to NMC or MCI who bought this palliative care into medical curriculum, uh, probably this FTP will help uh, us to build the team. That's what I'm expecting. Thank you. It is uh, our expectations also, Dr. Madhu, that uh, palliative medicine reaches the UG students as, and as far as possible. Welcome to this uh, session. Now I can see um, Dr. Yadav, Dr. Indiprabha Yadav. Hi. Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible. Uh, I am Dr. Indiprabha Yadav from uh, Department of Surgery. I am working as a traditional professor in the Department of uh, Surgery, Government Medical College, Kollam. 
uh, I have done a foundation course uh, one or two years back, but I have uh, done the assignment. But uh, as a part of this global course, I have done the assignment and got the certificate. And uh, uh, I think this faculty development course will be very useful in the long run uh, because uh, this will enable the uh, medical students to uh, know about the foundations or fundamentals of uh, uh, palliative care. Uh, is, uh, I'm yet to start my quality, uh, what do you call that, uh, actual practice. I have treated only three patients so far. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And warm welcome to the faculty development program. Now, going on, uh, Dr. Manish, Dr. Manish Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Manish Day. I'm currently assistant professor in Shantiniketan Medical College in Bolpur in West Bengal. And also, I am currently attached to Shoraj Gupta Cancer Center and Research Institute as a palliative care physician. And uh, uh, my department is, head is Dr. Rakesh Roy, who is a medical oncologist working here. So my uh, I have done my foundation course in palliative medicine from uh, Palliative India last year in September. And my background is uh, I've done my anesthesia in MD in anesthesia pain medicine and critical care from uh, Ames New Delhi. And after that, I did my fellowship of one year from uh, ESI Institute of Pain Management in Kolkata. And it also included palliative care. So my approach will be to uh, uh, gain knowledge about uh, the teaching programs. So what are the modules that are needed for a teaching program in undergraduate in my medical college? And also help me uh, uh, pertain knowledge and to uh, distribute it to the particular physicians the nurses and the staff who are all part of the palliative care team. So I am looking forward to uh, this program uh, eagerly. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manish, and warm welcome to the faculty development program. Moving on, um, now I can see Dr. Manoj. Dr. Manoj Bajaj. Good afternoon, ma'am. I am Dr. Manoj Bajaj from Imperial Bihari Vajpayee Medical College, Haisa, Haryana. Uh, I did my foundation course in, uh, from TIPS, uh, Pallium, uh, Pallium India, last year. So we have recently started our uh, palliative care of in this month. After this. I'm looking forward to gain more knowledge in Pallium. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Warm welcome. Uh, now I can see Dr. Melita. Melita Evelyn. Yeah. Hello. I am uh, working in... Uh, NDVP Medical College, Adgaon Nasik. I'm an anesthesiologist and I did the foundation course in 2021. And we don't have a palliative care unit here, but then we'll be able to start one. Thank you. Thank you. Was Dr. I audible? Uh, yes, we did lose you so, uh, a little bit to the end. Okay. I was thinking it was my fault. I'm a Nasik. Okay. Warm well, welcome, Dr. Malika. We don't have a... Get to meet each other in coming days. And next, I will move on to another doctor who has been unfortunately seeing my face for, I believe, most of the time in a day, Dr. Parul. It's good to see your face for the day. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Parul, and I am currently working as an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesia from the Shada Hospital, which is in UP. And uh, currently, I'm work. I'm also uh, a part of the Global Palliative Fellowship Program, which is with the Palium India. Um, along with the clinical work, I am uh, very keen in uh, teaching the students as well. I think with the Q. Warm welcome, Dr. Parul. Uh, anyways, we both have a long journey, so... <laughs> yeah, we do. It's, it's good, yeah. yeah. Moving on, uh, now I invite Dr. Pratiksha Agrawal to introduce yourself kindly. Dr. Pratiksha, I believe she is facing some difficulty in joining us. Actively. So now I may kindly call upon Dr. Preeta Susan George. Dr. Preeta.
when we have uh, difficulty from her end as well, I guess. Uh, Dr. Priyanka Mishra. Dr. Priyanka. Okay. Um, next, uh, it is the turn of Dr. Punitavati, another traveler with Pallium India. Uh, thank you, Shri. Uh, Shri Priya. Uh, I am Dr. Punita. I am from Coimbatore. I work in KMCH Medical College. Um, I am an anesthetist. I work as an assistant professor there. Uh, at my own capacity, I have already started practicing uh, pain and palliative uh, medicine. I am um, very keen in uh, integrating all these palliative care principles and teaching them to the undergraduate students. I am very excited about this course and to know how we can do it from the uh, clinical posting starts. Welcome, Dr. Punita. Anyways, we'll be seeing again in a couple of hours from now. Yeah. Dr. Rahul, Dr. Rahul Singh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my, myself, Dr. Rahul. I am working as an assistant professor in Almoda. It's near Nainital, situated near Nainital in Uttarakhand. So I am the first oncologist posted in this medical college. So we are not practicing any palliative. Uh, we do not have any palliative uh, uh, this uh, thing here. But uh, in future, uh, we will uh, like to uh, start this uh, palliative branch over here because this institute is uh, very new. Uh, it's uh, two years back, it's open, opened over here, and we do have only uh, two batches of MBBS. So, uh, and I have completed my foundation course in uh, January uh, of uh, 2023 only. So, thank you so much. Warm well, welcome, Dr. Rahul Singh. It's nice meeting you again. Now, I request Dr. Rasteep Kaur to kindly introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. Is I'm Edwell. Hello. Yes, yes Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Aidip Kaur, working as assistant professor in Department of Anesthesia and GMC Jammu. I have done my foundation course two years back. Then again, I did certified course of IAPC from AIMS Delhi. We have a palliative care unit under our department. We are running that. We have palliative OPDs and palliative ward. And currently, I'm working with my palliative care team as a member. We, de we have daily OPD basis patients. Now, uh, with this course, I'm looking forward to improve our teaching programs to teach our postgraduates. We are already taking their classes on palliative medicine, but uh, I think this will improve my further knowledge about this palliation medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, and welcome uh, to the program. Now I see Dr. Shirley Stephen. Dr. Shirley? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Shirley Stephen. I'm working as assistant professor in uh, Government Medical College, Adilabad in Telangana. Uh, I'm in the Department of Anesthesia, and um, we have uh, yet to start teaching the CBME model for the new batch of uh, UG students. We have a primitive palliative care setup, we have to improve it further. I've already finished the foundation course last year and it was a great experience doing the course. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Shirley. Thank you for being with Pallium India again and welcome to the program. Thank you. Um, now I can see Dr. Uh, Sirish. Good, good evening, ma'am, and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sidish Arya Somyajulu. I am working as an assistant professor in Gayatri Vidya Parishat, Vishakhapatnam, and I have recently finished my foundation course, and I'm doing my master course also simultaneously. So uh, I feel really, and be, I'm also practicing my palliative, palliative also from Sneha Sandhya Foundation in Vishakhapatna, in my college itself. So it's a great experience and I'm looking forward and I'm very grateful to Pallium India because of, through this, I am being introduced into this world of palliative 
and definitely and after finishing this this five days of this session i'll be also be uh, looking forward to take part active role in atcom for the benefit of the hand to introduce palliative care to the youngsters new coming doctors thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Sirish. It has been a pleasure having you in the Global Fellowship Program and here as well. Thank you. Well. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, I request Dr. Sujata K. Is it possible to introduce herself to others? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Now we are. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Sujata. I am working as assistant professor in community medicine in the department uh, of government E Road Medical College, which is located in Perumbura E Road. So, I currently teach medical students, and I am the nodal officer for non-communicable diseases. So, non-communicable diseases. There is a program run by the Tamil Nadu government, which is called as Makkalai Kedi Marthum. So, I am the nodal officer for that program in our institution. Uh, sorry, ma'am, you got muted towards the last part. Yeah, can you hear? Am I audible? Yes. So we do teach medical students. I felt uh, it will be better if I get trained in this faculty development program. I can train my co surgeons and students regarding faculty care. So I look forward for uh, energetic classes in the next five days. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, and welcome to the program. Uh, now I will be kind of a bit rushing because we have only three minutes left. And next, I invite Dr. Svetlana. Um, maybe we can come back to her. Dr. Swati. Dr. Swati Satai. Hello, I'm audible? Yes, yes. Yeah, hello, I'm Dr. Swati Sathe. I'm a maxillofacial surgeon and uh, professor and head at uh, a medical college in Gujarat. I've completed the foundation course and uh, with this course, I think uh, I am hoping to be a better team member uh, where the palliative care is concerned. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Warm welcome to the program. Now I can see Dr. Bharati. Good evening, madam. I am Dr. Bharati. I have done my certificate course in 2018-19 at Calicut, and I have uh, attended the foundation course also. I am interested to know how to train uh, all different cadets, those who want to work in uh, palliative care, and also the UG students, paramedical staff, nurses. How much we have to tell, and how we have to expect. Uh, service from them. So I am interested to attend this class. Sridhar Madam, I have met you at this meeting. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Dr. Bharti, and warm welcome to the Faculty Development Program. It is really our pleasure to have you with us again. Uh, Dr. Uma, you had left a message that if possible, you can introduce now. So I was just going through that message. I think she was traveling some other traveling bus. She had sent a message that now if her video is visible, she can introduce herself. So we will wait for that. We will just rush to Dr. Vanita, Dr. Vanita Rajagopalan. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Vanita, working as assistant professor of critical and intensive care medicine at AIMS New Delhi. I've done my foundation course last year in April. And uh, through this program, I uh, wish to learn more and impart that knowledge in the training of my team as well as the undergraduate team. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome to the faculty development program. Uh, Sri uh, Punita is now on the video. We can see her. I think uh, we were waiting for Dr. Umar. Hello, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, this is Dr. Uma, Associate Professor in Anesthesiology in Karpagavinayaga Medical College. 
I'm also an MEO member and a pain physician. So I'd like to start palliative care in our uh, college. And then uh, for a teaching program, being an MEO member, this program, attending this program is going to be really helpful for me, I guess. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am, and warm welcome. Uh, Rajagopal sir, I might take one or two minutes extra from you. Extremely sorry, because you have been the one taking minutes from us, but now we have only two participants left to introduce yourself. Please, to please, 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 please. Thank you, sir. Dr. Vivek? Hello, I'm um, Dr. Vivek. I am anesthesiologist from Avery. Man. We have recently started medical college. So I have con uh, completed a foundation course one year back. I am practicing anesthesia, pain, and palliative care in our institution. Thank you, Dr. Vivek, and I am welcome. I can see Mr. Bilal, uh, attendee, and keeping his video on. Unfortunately, he could not introduce himself in the first round. Dr. Bilal, are you available now? Oh, yes, ma'am. Sorry, uh, sorry for the inconvenience. I am Dr. Bilal. I am a student person in Community Medicine, Government Medical College, um, Trivandrum. Uh, here also, we are starting our um, palliative care unit in our medical college. Uh, so I am also keen on uh, how to uh, get along with the um, uh, new students, UG students and house surgeons who are coming to our um, uh, palliative care unit. Um, when we had that eight core module introduced into the um, curriculum, uh, I felt it some difficult in uh, um, uh, explaining some situations with the students. Uh, so I think I will get some exposure uh, through this program uh, into uh, that also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bilal, and welcome. And last but not the least, one of our another latest but active uh, comrades of Pallium India, Dr. Shravani. Hello, hello, uh, hello. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Shravani. I work as a senior resident uh, in psychiatry department in uh, Gayatri Vidya Parishat Vaisag. Uh, so I'm, uh, as you introduced me earlier, I am currently pursuing global fellowship program in Paleo. I look forward to learn the basics of teaching palliative care. Thank you and welcome uh, Dr. Shravani to the faculty development program. Now we have our first speaker for the day joining in. Those who have known about palliative medicine would also have known about Dr. Raja Gopal. <laughs> Uh, so it would be, it is indeed our pleasure and privilege to have him joining to give us more enlightenment on this particular program. What is Palim India's uh, vision regarding the program and all. So Dr. Sridevi, following the regular formal procedures, I invite you to introduce him formally to the best. Uh, sir, I'm not introducing me formally to this group because <laughs> all of them have uh, done our foundation course. I am so excited because as Punita mentioned in the chat, we have diverse group of palliative care practitioners. I mean, almost all departments here and uh, in working in various uh, positions, uh, people keen to start palliative care, new medical colleges, government medical colleges already established, people working in medical education. So we have a very diverse group. I'm sure we'll, we will learn a lot from this group also so that we can improvise our program, keep on improvising the program. So thank you so much everyone for uh, the warm introduction and making us feel good that uh, so many, to meet so many people, medical faculties from across the country. Uh, sir, without taking much time over to you, sir. Thank you, Sridevi. Uh, Sri Priya, see, you always say such nice things about me in flowery language. And look what you have done. You handed over to Sri Devi and she's not even saying a single sentence. But I'm so happy for all of them because I can see the relief on their faces. They were thinking, oh my God, here goes again. And all of a sudden, everybody has taken a breath, a deep breath. And uh, the relief on people's faces is very visible. So hello everybody, I wish I had uh, joined earlier. I mean, it would have been a treat to, uh, to get to know everybody a little more and uh, hear your plans. After I came in, I heard Dr. Uma say she's planning to start a palliative care program. Um, many others would have start, said the same thing. Many of you already have palliative care program, but uh, 
when somebody says we are going to start i hope uh, those people are will be connected to our facilitation team sri devi yes sir yes no. definitely okay hey, friends uh, uh, it is this is exciting see how much of suffering this group of people is going to remove not only with what you do in your palliative care service but the the larger effect of influencing a generation of medical students this is going to be tremendous so sri devi sri priya thank you for making all this happen and we have certainly a much kinder india to look forward to as things stand now we are not doing very well in the sense in the so called quality of death index which measures the status of palliative care globally india is still in the last on third on fourth not a good position at all india ranks below bangladesh in healthcare and in end of life care so we are not in an enviable spot yet but you are going to change this so uh, if i may share my screen uh, what do i do about getting rid of this thing <clears throat> this uh, more than 7 million is still an understatement it's likely to be closer to 10 million that means one crore of us one crore of us are in serious health related suffering certainly more than 7 million from chronic disease alone and this is making me scared i am not afraid of death but i am worried that if i go outside of my city in some other place and that's where i end up with being the prospects at the moment are horrendous you all know what all suffering people go through and the solution is something that the world health assembly i have talked to you about this at some point of time i am sure the world health assembly that is the decision making body of world health organization in its assembly of 67 in 2014 asked all member countries including india to integrate palliative care into health systems at all levels primary secondary and tertiary please note this having it only in one place is not good enough india's national health policy now thankfully has included in the primary level but uh, we are working hard to make sure that it also gets into the tertiary level so that you all from various medical colleges get some more support from the government to run palliative care because if not people go through disease specific treatment chemotherapy radiotherapy and all that rigmarole or anti retroviral therapy for ages in the medical colleges hospitals or some big hospitals with no palliative care and the result in the end you you have to go back to your village to get palliative care what a paradox so it is necessary at all levels across the continuum of care and this is something that you have to keep harping on when you teach your undergraduate students palliative care is not only for the dying palliative care is not only for those incurable pain relief and palliative care must reach every person who is in suffering whether it is short term term suffering or long term and please remember no definition of world of palliative care includes the term chronic diseases 
just not there. It is not there in WHO definition. And let me tell you why I harp on the point. Uh, day before yesterday, uh, father, possibly with uh, uh, mental illness, set fire, poured petrol over his daughter, two daughters and set fire to himself. He died on the spot. The two children survived. One died after 24 hours. The other is still surviving with very major burns, unlikely to survive. But imagine the pain that they go through. Have you seen people with major burns? Oh my God, I have seen enough. I don't want to see another one. And most of that pain is very easy to treat. In somebody coming to you with 70% burns, the torture is unbelievable and most of it is easily treated. So, from the beginning of the suffering, whatever be the reason, to the end, acute or chronic, malignant or non-malignant, this is important. So, rather obviously, Dr. Uma's palliative care center will be able to take care only of a small number of patients. See, Dr. Uma, and everybody else who is running a palliative care unit or hoping to start a palliative care unit, the bulk of relief of suffering will have to happen because of the integration into healthcare. When, even if they do not know anything else, if your medical student qualifies <clears throat> with the clarity about how to treat pain and how to communicate with the patients, that itself will have a dramatic influence on our country. So this is the bulk of it. Integration of palliative care into all healthcare. Of course, community support always strengthens this. This integration can happen at the national level, in your institution, of course, or in your private clinic, or own department alone. All possible. But is it this, this uh, likely to happen? Macro? It has already happened. So many things have happened which are facilitating the national uh, national transformation, the macro. There is a national program for palliative care which is being reviewed now. The laws governing opioids are being amended. The national health policy of 2017 includes palliative care at primary level. Not only a paper tiger. Sri Devi has been closely involved with training the national level trainers and state level trainers. And from next month, it is being rolled out to the states. And here is something that concerns us all enormously. It has been such a huge success that the MBBS curriculum now includes pain management, end of life care, of course, attitude, ethics, and communication. Much later, BSc nursing curriculum also. This is critical. Even if the nurses learn it, I mean, if the nurses learn, that'll be a great thing. But they can cannot even prescribe a pain medication unless the doctor knows this. So you are going to address this critical group, the MBBS students. And uh, there are 661 medical colleges or more in the country. It will take a long time to reach all of them. But look what's happening. You all come from so many institutions. And you are agents of change. You will transform not only the medical student's perception, but the face of medical practice in your place. Please, I hope you will all focus on that. Certainly teaching the medical students, but also running the palliative care service and thus influencing medical practice all over your institution. It will take time, I know, 
there will be resistance. Change is always resistant. But by being persistent, we can make changes. I leave the rest to uh, Sri Devi and the others. But uh, this is what Sri Devi told me. That it all comes under 20 modules, under 12 themes. Distributed from the foundation course to internship course. Internship in various departments. And uh, I know that it is permissible by the conditions of National Medical Commission for any medical college to have adjunct faculty. So you, uh, <coughs> any one of you can help with many, any other departments. Some of the teaching will have to be in pharmacology, some in community medicine and some in anatomy. The foundation goes. Wherever that is, if you are there, and you are willing, you are able to find the time, I am sure gradually you will get invited for more and more adjunct uh, lecturership in various departments. And I hope that will change a lot of things. Uh, Sri Priya, have I stolen minutes from you today also? Sir? Have I stolen minutes from you today also? Uh, no, sir, it is compromised since I stole a couple of minutes from you. <laughs> okay, right. So I am done. Uh, happy to answer any questions. I do not, I intend to stay on for a little more time. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir. Um, uh, Dr. Arun, uh, you have mentioned about the facilitation team. Uh, we'll be sending, uh, sharing the details of the facilitation team in the group, uh, and we'll tell you how they can help uh, you all we'll be putting in touch uh, with the team, uh, depending on the area where you work. So, yes, that will be shared in the, in the group today. So. Dr. Arun, uh, we have somebody leading the team in Trivandrum. Her name is Shalini. Uh, overall, uh, uh, over, oversight is from her. And in each region in India, we have a we have an, a facilitation officer who can work with you. Many things like uh, uh, organizing events or getting uh, teaching faculty, like uh, helping you to get get hold of opioids, getting the recognize medical institution status and so on. Thank you. That is for everyone I meant. Uh, uh, I've heard so many people talking about uh, starting palliative care units. So uh, we will share your contact information with the team also. So they will get in touch with you and uh, will work with you depending on what your needs are in your own states. So, Sir, uh, there is one more question. Yeah, I uh, saw my Dr. Manish's question. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Manish, we have to persuade those of True. Don't expect them all to change immediately. Change is resistant. Uh, but I am I'm, I'm not going to try to answer that question now because it's a, it's a big subject in itself. Something about organizing palliative care uh, that's not part of our agenda, uh, Sri Devi, in this session? Uh, no, sir, that's, that's not a part of uh, this program. Hmm. So, so uh, Sri Devi, uh, let me ask you. This session, faculty development program, happens over how many sessions? So, five days, and most of them <clears throat> have undergone the foundation course where we had the session on organized faculty. That's okay, so so uh, let us uh, uh, consider one thing, uh, Sri Devi and Sri Priya. Let us offer those who want it a six session, add on session, not necessarily a part of this, maybe an add on. Whoever wants can come in, especially those uh, who need to, who plan to start palliative care. 
I'm sure many of uh, the people here will want that. And then we can sit together and talk about um, all the clearing, all the doubts. Because when we did the session during an introductory course, many of these points wouldn't have struck home. And some people have tried and then come up with major obstacles. Those also can be tackled. So how about it? Sure, sir. Either a formal or or informal session. Dr. Manish, we will address your issues. Dr. Sirish supports me. Thank you, Dr. Sirish. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Shripriya. Our next faculty ma'am has joined. Yes, yes. Dr. Kadambari is already with us. So I was just waiting to hand over to you to introduce her. Sir, sir, we are moving on to the next session on of course. principles of integration. Of course. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your vision about the undergraduate program with this faculty members. Thank you so much. So next, uh, we have a session on... So we have been hearing about the word integration from when Dr. Raj Gopal was presenting and when we were introducing. So it would be good to know a little bit more about integration than because we use that word very casually and very frequently when it comes to medical education. So it's my privilege to welcome Dr. Kazambari. Uh, Ma'am is heading the Department of Surgery at JIPMAR and she is a part of whole group of resource persons at NTDC program uh, run by JIPMAR every year. That is a national teacher training program uh, run by the Medical Education Unit at JIPMAR. Uh, I happened to listen to her uh, last year then I understood that integration is more than just a word that we casually use. There are certain things that we need to understand as uh, an education expert. So welcome you, ma'am. Thank you so much for agreeing again this year. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this program. Thank you, Dr. Sri Devi, for inviting me and making me, uh, giving me an opportunity, actually, making me a part of your group. Uh, it's a privilege to join you. Good afternoon, sir, Dr. Raj Gopal. And uh, very good afternoon to all the participants. Um, so uh, can I start sharing my slides? Yes, ma'am, please. Okay. okay. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry I couldn't join earlier, so I'm not very familiar with all the participants. Um, I'm sure all of you must be actively involved in uh, training undergraduates. So, uh, and probably you're from uh, uh, institutions which um, are running the current uh, competency-based medical education curriculum from the NMC. So as you... Uh, already probably are familiar with this term integration. It's a main thrust area of the CBMA curriculum. And uh, I would like to uh, act as, uh, put it in a little simpler way and try to uh, bring to you the concept of what integration actually is and um, how do we as teachers aid or uh, facilitate this integration, which we are all talking about. So I'm from uh, the Department of Surgery, JIPMA. I've been involved in undergraduate education for more than 25 years now. And I have been associated with the medical education unit of JIPMA since 2006. Okay. Um, so we'll begin with what is integration, right? Integration basically means putting together many parts so that you get a whole. But as we all know, the whole is more than the just the sum of the parts. It's not just uh, to bring a more familiar concept, bringing in anatomy, surgery, physiology, medicine. These are the parts and putting it together and trying to understand the practice of medicine. So the practice of medicine is much bigger than simply knowing anatomy, physiology, and other subjects. So uh, that is what is integration. And that is something that 
we expect to happen during our undergraduate training program. So if you look at the day, a day in the life of a doctor, there are so many activities and so many expectations from a doctor from diagnosing, prescribing and offering treatment and also to stay current with uh, knowledge and technology, etc., and also to have the service orientation. So there are different aspects to a doctor's practice, which we have to put together and integrate. So our life itself as a doctor is one huge effort at integration. So it it's, wouldn't be wrong to say that it is a core aspect of medical practice itself. So as teachers, when we talk about integration, what do we need to think about? One is we need to understand what it is and how actually it occurs. And the second question is as teachers, what are the ways in which we can ensure or we can help this process of integration to take place? So beginning with the first question, what is integration? Uh, you can, I'll give you 30 seconds. You can type in the chat box what you mean by the word integration. What comes to your mind when we use the term integration? Okay, there are no responses. Has anybody responded, Dr. Sridhari? Okay, bring together, put together, merging, inclusion and distribution of knowledge, join together. All right. Okay, so in terms of coupling, uh, compiling all knowledge, I suppose that means everyone participates in developing services, bringing up different disciplines together. Yes, yes merged into one another so that the parts are no longer seen. Okay, right, thank you. So in terms of learning or in terms of education, integration refers to knowledge synthesis. That is synthesizing different sources of knowledge and developing your own knowledge. So that means the uh, student or the learner is able to make connections in order to develop new knowledge. So essentially, integration is happening in the mind of the learner, okay? That's the first thing that we need to understand. So it has to, whatever you do, whatever efforts you make, ultimately integration has to happen in the mind of the learner. So if you take our MBBS students, there are so many subjects that they have to study about. And each of them are heavy and taxing with in terms of the vastness of the content. So it is the student has to, as they go through the course, they have to make all the connections between these various subjects so that they can traverse the complex path of medical practice. So this is where integration is important in undergraduate medical education. So basically, they are trying to connect and correlate uh, knowledge from different sources, basic science, clinical, et cetera. And, uh, and by making these connections and developing new knowledge, they are able to understand what is required of them to uh, practice medicine as a professional. So these are three ways in which I would say integration can be looked at. One, it is an educational outcome, which is integration of learning, which is what we are trying to aim at. Two, it can be looked at as, at a, as, a, as a learning process. That is where knowledge and memory, like I mentioned earlier, integration happens in the mind of the learner. So it is a learning process. It's a mental process, which is happening in the mind of the learner. And the third aspect of integration is, is what are the educational practices which are required to achieve this outcome, which is integration of learning. And one of them is curriculum integration. 
So if you look at integration as a learning outcome or integration of learning, it refers to a higher order learning. So the student moves from understanding basic concepts to more abstract conceptualizations. That is what going back to the first point that putting together information from different subjects and coming up with how to practice medicine. So that's a more abstract concept. You don't, it is how the student learns the different subjects and makes the connections and finally develops a uh, practice of medicine. So isolated facts are put together and they find newer and different ways of using that knowledge. Why is this important? Because we want students to have a meaningful learning. And this happens only if current knowledge is used to be built upon by adding new information. So new information is in a way integrated with current knowledge to make meaning uh, to make uh, learning more meaningful and to develop a domain of knowledge, a, a vast knowledge base. If they are not able to make these connections, whether it is current knowledge with new knowledge or knowledge from different sources, knowledge gained at different times. So knowledge gained in the first phase with knowledge gained in the third phase of the curriculum, knowledge learned in different places, knowledge gained in the classroom, in the bedside, in the community. There are so many areas where knowledge is gained. So they have to put together all this knowledge in order to build a domain of knowledge. And this is where this integration is important. The second way of looking at integration is what I said as a mental process, right? So it, this process of integration is happening in the mind of a learner and where they are able to put all these different information sources, they are able to not only identify and but they are also able to establish the relationships and therefore they expand their knowledge base. So in, for example, undergraduate education, making connections within different, say, uh, if you take physiology, making connection between uh, the neurologic, the physiology of the nervous system with physiology of the cardiovascular system and so on, or between various subject domains, making connections between anatomy and physiology, anatomy and surgery and physiology and medicine and so on. So this is knowledge integration and that's how, that's what we expect to happen in undergraduate education. So integration is not something which is a, a new thing or to be learned as a, a new technique. It is, it is natural to us as thinking individuals. And it starts very early in childhood. Children as young as four to six years are known to add on new knowledge to what they have already been exposed to. Right? So they, they have, it is a naturally occurring process to build on pre-existing knowledge. And it starts as early as the age of four. And by the age of six, as the child gets used to this process, they become more and more independent. They have faster processing speeds. They have a wider knowledge base. So they need very little uh, support from the teacher or the external environment to uh, to, to process this information and to integrate it. So what we need to do as teachers is just to build on this naturally occurring process and to facilitate it, right? So therefore, core, the core uh, aspect of integration is to have a knowledge base, right? So unless there is a knowledge base, they will not be able to make these connections. And to, uh, fundamental to building the knowledge base is building memory. And this integration should happen at the memory level itself. So before we go into what is memory integration, I'll quickly digress here to revise with you. I'm sure all of you must be knowing this already. Just quickly to revise how learning actually occurs to any in any experience in life, right? So as human beings, we go through several experiences. I'm not talking about simply our experiences in school or college or academic experiences. 
life in general. And all these experiences are, uh, you can say they are uh, stored or they are, uh, I won't use the word stored, they are assimilated in different areas of the brain and with, and they are called, these are called representations in various locations in the brain. And this process of uh, where these experiences are located in the brain, that is called encoding. Now, when these representations are solidified or made more uh, concrete during the act of sleeping, right? And this entire process, sorry, yeah, this entire process is called, is, it leads to the storage of information. Now, it is not necessary if information is simply stored, right? It will get lost out. All of you must have heard of short-term and long-term memory. So how it gets encoded in long-term memory is storage and retrieval are required for, knowledge, uh, for learning to actually occur. And this is simple. It's simple one, uh, you know, education 101, you can call it. We teach them, we help them to build the knowledge, and then we test them in order to retrieve whatever learning has happened so that it gets more concretely uh, in, uh, in, ingrained in their memory. So for, for this kind of integration of memory to happen, reactivation of prior knowledge is when they are learning new information is being shown to uh, result in a stronger association. So obviously the applied aspect of this statement is that when you ask a question in surgery, for example, I'm a surgeon. So when I ask them a question in surgery in the exam, if I ask them a question in a portion of it in anatomy, they are able to make better association between surgery and anatomy. Happens with all the other subjects as well, right? Because actively reactivating by constantly retrieving the information, previously learned information, is it is it builds a stronger memory base. Now, coming to a very primarily, uh, I mean, a very basic question: Why is integration needed? Would anybody like to uh, answer this question? Why do you think integration is needed? This kind of knowledge integration. Clinical application, okay, better understanding, yes. Oh, better outcome, okay, I would take that as a learning outcome, yes. Better understanding. Uh, Dr. Vandana, you wanted to say something? Is there, somebody has raised their hand? Uh, is there a doubt? Somebody has a doubt? I think Dr. Vandana was trying to uh, uh, speak, but yeah. yeah uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, yes, please. Actually, in the curriculum, uh, we have something called horizontal integration, vertical uh, integration. So basically, yeah. integration, how it helps is it helps to connect the various departments so that the knowledge can be effectively uh, correlated with each other, and then it can be applied as well. So it serves two purposes. One is it helps to correlate with whatever we are learning from different uh, uh, departments, or I would say different subjects. And then it also helps us to apply it practically and clinically. Yeah, you're right. That is uh, one way of achieving the integration, which is uh, very um, strongly proposed by the uh, our uh, CBMA curriculum. Right, so to answer, Answer this question, I will go to a, just now uh, Dr. Vandana mentioned integrating basic and clinical sciences, right? All of us are, uh, I, I don't think any of us disagree that this is an important aspect of undergraduate training. So why do we need this? 
because we want them to understand clinical signs and symptoms. We want them to relate clinical features to mechanisms of disease. We want them to develop diagnostic reasoning and to solve difficult diagnostic problems. So by re recollecting their basic anatomy, physiology, etc., they are able to solve a diagnostic problem, right? So I'll have, I'll give you a quick question here. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are clinicians. I'm sure most of you are. Do you, in your routine practice, use your knowledge of basic science in your routine practice, okay? in your day-to-day -day practice. Do you use your knowledge of basic science to make a diagnosis? Can you answer in the chat box? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. All right. Okay. So, um, okay. I did, uh, actually, um, many of us, if you really look it to yourself and ask yourself, are you using your knowledge of basic science to make a diagnosis consciously? Okay, this is the anatomy, this is the physiology, and therefore this is the diagnosis. We don't usually go through that systematic process, okay? So it depends on the level of the learner. So if you take a novice learner like an undergraduate final year student, when they are taking history or uh, uh, doing a physical examination in the bedside, they are consciously recollecting their knowledge of anatomy and physiology to make a diagnosis, okay? When they're auscultating the lung, they say, okay, in this area, it would be the lower lobe, in this area, it's the apex, so that they are trying to. But when we do it as clinicians and as experienced clinicians, we don't always uh, consciously add that element of our knowledge of uh, basic senses. It is already there in our mind. And this is the process which is known as encapsulation, right? It's already there. We don't go step by step. We jump a few steps. And the second thing in experienced uh, clinicians is the formation of what are known as illness scripts, okay? So illness scripts is, as I have uh, seen patients over the last 30 years of my practice, I have seen similar patients with slight differences in the way they present. So I have a script in my mind of what, for example, uh, a breast cancer would look like, would present with, or will, what would be the clinical features, what will be the examination. So I will have a script. So when I'm seeing a patient, I don't need to take 45 minutes to actually make a diagnosis because I already have that script in my mind. So these happen, these things happen as we uh, become more and more experienced in our, in our clinical practice. But there is an exception. If I face a difficult situation, if I face a diagnostic dilemma, then I will go back to my knowledge of basic sciences in order to explain what is happening and to make a, uh, a reasonably correct diagnosis, right? So we do need basic sciences. The way we use it differs according to our level of experience. Okay, so therefore, in, in undergraduate training, it will help students to deal with complex problems. It will foster higher order thinking. You must be familiar with this term. Uh, vertical integration, as you have rightly mentioned, addresses uh, problems which are real world. That is, clinicians can share their experiences and and uh the student is able to understand okay this uh, a point i need to learn in anatomy because this is where i'm going to apply it in my practice it makes them more involved in their learning it gives them some meaning and it uh, quickly catches their attention and it enhances reinforcement of important areas or topics and above all retention of learning which we saw a little earlier how retrieval and how integration of memory happens and in, uh, is required for developing the knowledge base. Now, the second question which we need to address is, what should be integrated and when? This is a very straightforward answer. We need to integrate content knowledge and skill development in addition to uh, integrating basic with uh, uh, clinical sciences and so on. So the first thing that comes often to our mind is 
when we talk about integration is horizontal and vertical integration. Because those are the most often talked about terminologies. But what we should be thinking about is a little more broader way of looking at integration. They should integrate all the different experiences that they have in the classroom, by the bedside, different settings that they learn in, different sources that they learn from. All these experiences they should be able to put together in order to develop a, a, an idea of what medical practices all about. So, in therefore, in undergraduate education, you have not only basic sciences and clinical sciences, uh, the applied skills, the knowledge gained from prior experiences, their own uh, a little bit of introspection, right? Which is what the uh, attitude development is all about. And what we call communication, that is the social knowledge of how to interact with others, not only their peers, but also their uh, colleagues from other disciplines, other healthcare professions, uh, patients, relatives, and so on. So all these are required to be integrated in order to create the whole in Indian medical graduate. So therefore, integration is implemented beyond the classroom. What we talk about horizontal and vertical integration is usually confined to the classroom. We call a clinician, we call a basic scientist, we ask them to discuss and so that is in the classroom, but actually it happens elsewhere as well. It happens in the simulation center, it, it happens at the bedside and the interprofessional uh, uh, settings where they work as a team, for example, in the community. So this is a very important um, question that we need to understand and answer, especially in this setting where you are uh, talking about integrating palliative care into the undergraduate training. Because standing in a classroom and talking to them about palliative care may not have the same impact as taking them to a center or uh, to a clinic where palliative care is being uh, you know, implemented, where they can actually experience, talk to patients, see what is being done there. We, because it's not simply the knowledge, we also want okay. them to develop an attitude towards palliative care. Yeah. Huh? So how can we as teachers scaffold this integration? So one is the role of the learner, because as I said, it's happening in the mind of the learner. So the learner has to have effective learning skills. And then us as teachers, we have uh, our major role in teaching and assessment and also in designing the curriculum. So learning strategies, they have to have effective learning strategies where they can develop a knowledge base. I'm not going into that. As teachers, we, there are many uh, strategies which have been described. We go into the depth of the curriculum. We give enough time for instruction. You, any, any connections that have to be made, any sort of uh, uh, making these uh, linkages between prior and new knowledge, all this requires time. You cannot hurry it up, right? So you need to give enough instructional time for it to happen. And there is this concept of desirable difficulties. Uh, I will not go into those details. Those of you who are interested can look them up. It's just that you space out the curriculum, you space out the uh, learning events. And uh, also you have uh, this, uh, wait, uh, yeah. So this is the concept of desirable difficulties. So, you give them challenges and you create difficulties. For example, you could give them an assignment, right? Where they will have to uh, find out answers for your question by maybe going into the field, maybe looking up literature, maybe talking to people. So they, they learn by actually doing and uh, you don't provide them with ready-made answers. So, this is one way, and this enhances long-term retention and transfers. That is desirable difficulty. And uh, we also help learners to learn effective learning techniques. And last is the, I purposely put this thing at last because curriculum arrangement, like what you were talking about, the horizontal and vertical integration is 
probably not just the only way. There's much, much more that we need to do as teachers to promote integration of learning. So for example, when you take a class, uh, if uh, as again, coming back to my own subject as a surgeon, when I'm taking a class, I have to continuously help them to make the connections. Maybe ask them a few questions in when I'm taking a bedside clinic, again, because I'm uh, more inclined towards breast surgery. So if I take a class on a patient who is presenting with breast lump or coming to the example of palliative care, if you're dealing, talking to them about a patient who requires end of life care, right? Constantly keep making connections between their, uh, their physical um, condition and what, what is causing that physical condition, or how you can explain that, what is, and keep helping them to make connections among the concepts in different subjects. Also in your assessment, it's very, very important because you must, you must have already heard of the, uh, you know, the saying that assessment drives learning. So unless we assess, it's also important because they need to retrieve their knowledge. So you design an assessment which will make them establish that connection amongst the concepts. So one example can be you give MCQ items, let them select the answer, ask them a question after the MCQ item to explain why they have made that choice. So that would be one of the ways in which you, so then it, they have to make uh, a given explanation for why they chose a particular uh, option. So this uh, use of assessment to build integration is known as the testing effect or the retrieval practice effect. So retrieval practice depends on your on the cues you provide them. Cues here refer to the questions. So it all depends on if your question tests only memory, then it will test only memory. But if your question is so designed that it tests whether they have made those connections in their memory, then the answer also will require for them to demonstrate that they have made those connections. So some of the ways uh, in our previous uh, session, when I took this uh, particular topic, I had asked the uh, participants to uh, share what they do to promote integration. And some of them had listed these uh, possibilities of starting with a real case scenario, uh, uh, emphasizing applied aspect, uh, calling a teacher from the clinical side to come and uh, you know, talk about the applied aspects, personal experience, early clinical exposure, and so on. So there are many ways of promoting integration and it all depends on you. So there is no prescribed way of doing it. There is no single right way of doing it. All we need to understand is we are helping them to make those connections between different aspects of their learning. And we can do it as uh, we see fit. Similarly, on assessment, they had talked about giving group tasks, asking a basic science question as part of a long answer question, using formative assessment methods and so on. So finally, the curriculum arrangements. And the literature is replete with different ways of having integrated curriculum, right? So all these big diagrams and charts and all are available, horizontal, vertical, spiral, H-shaped to Z-shaped and so on. You can have all this on paper, but unless you, you actually promote them to make their connections, all this will not be of, uh, I mean, it's just remained on paper. This is the famous Harden's Ladder. Some of you might be familiar with it. These are very difficult terms, but ultimately it means that subjects which are taught in isolation, which happens most often traditionally in our, uh, that is the lowest level of the ladder. And finally, at the highest level, you have a transdisciplinary integration where there is no anatomy, physiology, medicine, surgery. It's, uh, there are no boundaries. There are no, um, you know, differentiation between different subjects. So that is finally, uh, that is labeled as an integrated curriculum. So curriculum strategies themselves cannot simply produce integration of learning. So what we need to see is that knowledge is built slowly and you often revisit the learned information. So 
anatomists should ask questions from the applied aspects of the surgical importance of anatomy. Surgeons should ask questions from anatomy to help them to make those connections. So that has to go. So uh, there are uh, in uh, MBBS curriculum, we need to be trained. All of us should have our own responsibilities, uh, developing integrated modules, design integrated assessment, and then have a design for our, how to deliver the curriculum. There are lots of challenges as you must be facing in your day-to-day -day practice. Basically, there is a lack of will, leadership support. The most common thing which comes up is we have only two faculty in our department. How can we go and uh, uh, you know, uh, participate in a surgery class or a medicine class? There are three fixed mindset, they say no, um, the clinician will not support me or the basic scientist will not support me. So uh, these are prefix mindset. There is, I will lose my importance as a basic science teacher if I bring in the clinician too often or if I keep talking about the clinical importance. Multiple teachers are required. Um, it will cause confusion. Department will lose its identity. So these are some of the, uh, I would almost say these are misconceptions, right? For example, this concept that multiple teachers are required. Actually, it isn't. If you take an undergraduate uh, uh, student or undergraduate curriculum, uh, I have been through the MBBS training and so have you. So you know what anatomy or what physiology they should be learning or they should know in order to understand surgery. So if I wanted to give a little more information on surgery or uh, on anatomy, and if I wanted to ask them a few detailed questions in anatomy, I can talk to my colleague in anatomy and get some information from him or her and incorporate it in my class. I don't necessarily have to disturb my colleague in anatomy to come and spend an hour with me in my theory class talking about anatomy, which I can as well uh, discuss, right? So it just requires uh, communication between teachers of different disciplines to build the session. So I will end with a few take home messages. Integration, primarily we should understand occurs in the mind of the learner. Integration of learning is the desired outcome of any education. Knowledge integration is a process which begins automatically in childhood. Knowledge base is central to integration of learning. There is no escaping that. Memory integration is required for building the knowledge base and that's what we should promote. And as teachers to promote integration, we need to go into depths of certain curricular aspects, particularly conceptual understanding. We should give enough time for integration to happen and introduce desirable difficulties to promote their knowledge integration. Assessments are very important by, they, by uh, providing an opportunity for practicing retrieval. Curricular arrangements themselves are not enough and they do not result in integration of learning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, we'll wait for a few minutes uh, if there are any questions. Yeah, certainly. Either you can unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat. If you have any questions or you want to share some experience that you had in your own Madam, I am Dr. Bharati. Yes, yes, ma'am, uh, please. Madam, we are uh, talking about uh, undergraduates, uh, MBBS. Will, there will be difference between different cadets also, no, madam, yeah, while teaching, like for nurses, for paramedical staff, like that. So to each cadre, how much we have to teach and what to teach? Will there be difference? Or the same can be applied to all? I think that question is for uh, Dr. Sri Devi. Are you talking about palliative medicine, madam? Because in palliative medicine, we will have all type of cadre who will be there. And we have to give training to all those people now, madam. 
Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, in practice, yes. But uh, I think for today's uh, session or for this particular faculty development program, we'll be focusing only on MBBS uh, uh, student education, undergraduate medical education. We won't be uh, talking about the other uh, other courses. That is a little out of the scope for this particular course. Oh, okay, madam. Uh, my uh, about undergraduates is we will be different disciplines like uh, clinical uh, subjects, paraclinical subjects, and also the non clinical subjects will be there. So, while teaching a topic, we will take a case basis or we will take like a topic and uh, integrate all the others also. Because, uh, suppose ah. if we want to teach. Uh, some uh, end of life care. We will take a different disciplines and tell them like pharmacology and anesthesia and uh, uh, anatomy like that. And then we tell them what drugs to be given and where to be given like that to the undergraduate. Or we will take a particular case scenario and then deal. How we are going to plan, madam, for UG classes? Uh if i may um, take that question actually i in the way i look at integrating palliative care into the mbbs curriculum all of us uh, are qualified doctors and all clinical specialists uh, should be talking about palliative care like for example if i'm taking a class on some malignancies, let's say carcinoma breast. As part of my teaching, whether it's a bedside clinic or it's a theory class on breast cancer, I should also incorporate a discussion on end of life care. So it's not always necessary to bring in a pharmacology. If you have a session dedicated, say you have a module on um, uh, what you call uh, in palliative care, then you can bring in uh, specialists and have case scenarios and each specialist can uh, give their uh, inputs and talk about how to manage that particular patient. But the best way to integrate any of these aspects is I feel if every bedside discussion, every if I see a patient with advanced CA breast, I should also discuss end of life care with them. Only then they will develop the habit of thinking about these kind of issues. Uh, okay, ma'am. Then we have to go by topic wise, not like. Uh... There is no prescribed method, madam. You decide as a teacher, depending on the situation and whether you can deal with it yourself. May I know your specialty, ma'am? I am a gynecologist, madam. Okay. So when you take a bedside clinic, madam, for undergraduates, say you have an advanced CA over here, whatever, or you can bring in this idea of end of life care, even in, so they get, the students get the idea that every clinician should know about palliative care. They may not actually practice it. Uh, they may not practice gynecology when they become, uh, they take up specialty, but they know, okay, this is the, uh, you know, uh, this is an important aspect of care that they should be familiar with. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And there are a few questions about desirable yes, difficulties. Uh, Can I just answer those? Okay. Yes, so, yes, yes. It, as the term itself uh, indicates, desirable difficulty is uh, you give them difficulties which help them to learn better. That is why they are called desirable difficulties. So it should not be a difficulty which is, you know, uh, trying to make them insecure. It is a difficulty. Like what I meant here is don't give them all the information um, in a class or in a session. You leave them to answer some questions on their own. Let them go and find out information in any way from a textbook or from discussing with somebody or going into the community and doing it, visiting a, a center or whatever, whatever the question is addressing. So as teachers, 
we pose these situations of difficulties where we don't give them all the answers ourselves. We push them to find out the answers for certain questions. That is desirable. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, ma'am. I think the other questions were regarding the where uh, exactly in which year palliative care is taught. So uh, that is your answer. <laughs> I have uh, answered. Um, so okay. the sheet which I told will be shared. Uh, Shripri has already uploaded that in the IAPO. So it has a chart which shows um, where all which all topics are integrated, and based on that, we have, we'll be sharing the resource materials also. Many of the resource materials are already uploaded, so please open the IAPO. And uh, I think Dr. Manish has asked, so just go to the uh, uh, materials that we have shared and let us know. Uh, are there any other questions before we wind up today's session? Can't find anything in the chat. I think if there are no more questions, we can wind up today's session. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, once again for thank agreeing you. to come again this year. And this is very, very yeah. valid for as a beginning of this uh, whole program. Thank you so much uh, for helping us with this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kadambari, for enlightening us. Uh, thank you for that wonderful start you have given. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And um, we will uh, meet again tomorrow with uh, discussion on uh, serious health-related sufferings, introducing ethics and communication, how to introduce ethics and communication in the crowded curriculum, with uh, discussion for a uh, topic mentioned on day three as well. So please do join in in on time with us tomorrow as well. See you again tomorrow. Till then, this is Sri Priya along with Dr. Kadambari and Dr. Sridhi Varya signing off from the Tips Echo Hub. See you tomorrow. Till then, everyone take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.